efforts towards reconciliation come in many forms, and not always in the shape or form we might expect. Joining us now for more, Chief R. Stacey Laforme, elected chief of the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the author of Living in the Tall Grass, Poems of Reconciliation. And we're pleased to have him here tonight. Welcome. It's a pleasure to meet you, Chief Stacey. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Nice to meet um, you. So how did this collection of poems come to be? Hmm, this collection of poems started when I was 29 years old. I started writing poetry to deal with the loss of my life, the loss of my mother. So I was um, writing um, stories about what happened and how I felt, and, and I was at work. And so I would, um, I didn't want anybody to know what I was doing, because obviously I'm at work. <laughs> and so when anybody go by, I'd screen down real fast, and so they wouldn't see. And so, and so I, I finished off the poem, and um, I, there's another reason I actually, you know, screened down so people couldn't see it, is because um, men didn't write poetry back then. So there's a bit of a sh of shame of what you were doing. Well, I wouldn't know if it's shame, but it's more of embarrassment that you know people aren't used to seeing men who actually sit down and write poetry at that time. But um, I got through it. I um, managed to show it to my boss, and it was um, Abuse Awareness Month, and she said we could use that poem because it was about abuse. And it was called um, what was it called? It was, <laughs> you don't know, but it, it was it was a poem in a book, and it was called um, Forgiveness, and it was about abuse and loss. And so I gave it to the woman to use for their awareness month. Mm. And she goes, I'll do it as long as you change one line. And I said, what line is that? She said, the end, because the ending is, the ending is, um, it was I should, something about should, hell should, or should, be, should I should give forgiveness, but I, you know, so, so anyway, I said, I'm not going to change the end. And she goes, well, we can't use it then. You so, didn't want to change the end because you uh, felt like, you're allowed to have that emotion at least once in your life. Yeah, I didn't want to change the ending because these are stories and moments in people's lives. And, and sure, we want to get to you know, a different place. We want to get to healing and wellness. Mm -hmm. But there are moments in time and stories in people's lives that deserve to be told. And I thought, this is one of those moments. And so I refused to let it go. Now, you see, the interesting thing was when I was in grade eight, I had to write a poem for class, English class. And your teacher changed something in the poem. Yes. But never told you why, yes. what was, why they made those changes. Yes. So you felt they were, that your teacher was critiquing you or judging you? I, I suppose back then I thought she was judging me. And um, so that happened without telling me or explaining. I never wrote again until I was 30 years old. So you so kind of had like a writer's old. block for a while. Well, I don't know if it was block, but <laughs> I walked away from it for a while. Uh -huh. Yeah. And um, the book is called Living in the Tall Grass. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, living in the tall grass means two things to me. First off, it means um, where the indigenous people live is not you know, manicured lawns or always well watered or where things are easier. We live a life that's sometimes difficult, where it's not just about what's for supper. It's sometimes it's about if there's going to be supper. So I wanted to show the perspective of this is the tall grass. This is where there are bugs, there's weeds. Where things are rough. But on the other side of that, I want to say living in the tall grass speaks to the perspective of the knowledge we care about Mother Earth and the feelings we have to the land and the water. And there's a lot of beauty in the tall grass as well. Yes, there is. And you've divided the book into seven sections. Um, what do those represent? Actually, the first section, I think it's eight section. Mm -hmm. The first section is about Mother Earth and talks about our relationship, you know, the common ground we share with all people and our connection to the Earth. The, um, and then the seven, seven values? Chapters. Yeah, the next seven chapters are about the values we aspire to as indigenous people. What are those? <laughs> That's, this, is this a test? Well, no, well you, it's honesty, <laughs> truth, truth love, bravery, yeah. cur courage, humility, wisdom, and respect. Yes. I'm, I'm, yes. Why, why put the book out in that way? So it was, it was interesting. I was um, putting together my poems, and I said, there's got to be a, a flow to this. You know, I want to talk about the past. I want to talk about where we come from, where we are today where we're going tomorrow and where we want to be in the future. So I said, the best way to do that would be to use our value systems. So start out with one of the values. And certainly there are poems that could fit into other sections. But I think this way it flows and it shows that our history was rough and some of the things that we have um, went through was difficult and we had many challenges, but we've managed to move ourselves forward using the value systems that we've always had. And so I, 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 know, I know it's probably like, um, it's a hard, question to answer, of those values, what do you think is the most important one? Wow. 
you know how many people have asked that question over the years. It, it is very difficult. I guess for me, I've always felt that the foundation is respect. You know, if you have respect, you can live your life and get through your life respecting other things, respecting other people, not judging them. So to me, it's a core value. Some would tell you that love is more important because that's foundation of who we are together, right? Interaction between man. Mm -hmm. But for me, I've always looked at respect. And I guess all the other values can kind of stem from respect. Yes. Um, at speaking engagements, you often begin by uh, performing a poem. Why is that? I, I learned early on that I could stand in front of a crowd and quote facts and figures, but as soon as the test was over, they'd forget them. But I believe that the arts, and my chosen art is poetry, have a way of bridging gaps and reaching people on a different level. And if we make a connection you know, from here, it can last a lifetime. So beyond speaking about economics or, pol or politics, you think that that's the way to get to each other? That's a way of understanding each other. Um, what can art like poetry communicate that normal words cannot? Ah, it can let you live for a few minutes in the feet of someone else. You can actually become that person for a moment in time and understand mm -hmm. where the perspective is. And certainly if you understand me and I understand you, we can talk about so many different things without being angry, without being upset. We can go forth in a good relationship. So I believe it helps with that. And what, in regards to reconciliation, how can art be a tool for that? Uh -huh. Well, reconciliation is about so many, so many broad things, but it's, and one of the things it's about is um, respecting and acknowledging diversity, welcoming diversity, because it's how we become better today than we were yesterday. And I think that poetry and the arts transcends boundaries that we may have and lets us connect. And, and you realize that, wow, this person has something unique and special. I could use that. Not use in the sense of using, mm -hmm. but, you know, I like that. It's something we can work on together. So You can learn from it. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, last December, you were re-elected as chief of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nations. What are you hoping to achieve in your second term? I guess what I hope to achieve in the first term, if I could, mm -hmm. was to raise awareness and knowledge about not only the Mississaugas and our treaty lands and how broad our territory is, but to raise awareness about the history, to raise awareness about the indigenous relation with Canada. Because you'd be surprised, even today, during the 150, when I went around and participated, I was surprised myself that there were pockets of people who knew a lot about indigenous issues, mm -hmm. but there were also pockets who knew almost nothing about us. So it's a vast experience, a vast learning experience for me, and I hope for a lot of other people during that process. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that you don't want to run again after the second term? I am actually going to retire after this because the first term I, I um, committed you know, to up to four or five meetings a day, seven days a week. And um, this term, I'm going to try and back off a little, but it's still going to be that same pace. And I really don't know that I could carry that out much longer and still maintain a family relationship <laughs> with my entire family. So it's, it's difficult to sometimes with those. To balance everything? Yes, to balance those things. Um, and speaking of reconciliation, I'd like to show you a clip from our show in November when we spoke to Serene Fox about reconciliation. And mm -hmm. here's what she had to say. There's a new thing that people are talking about now called reconciliation fatigue um, from the Indigenous perspective, which I think is also a real thing because part of the dialogue is that Indigenous people are expected to inform um, and help people unpack our truths and quite you're often. Tired of doing that? Well, it's not that I'm tired of doing it. I think I I feel like I have an obligation to do it, but I think there are a lot of people who feel like settler populations need to start to do their own work hmm. in figuring out the truth of this country and not just saying, well, I didn't know. Can you relate to what she said? Oh, absolutely. I, I think that one of the things that you have to understand about reconciliation is you have to have knowledge, you have to have history, you have to have understanding, then you have to move to equality, and then you have to move to justice. So that's all incorporated, and we can't go forward without looking back. And how to do that is to understand and have difficult conversations, or in my case, read some difficult stuff on paper, to understand the history and why things were the way they were, and why they are the way they are today, and how we can go forward in the future. So absolutely, I can share her, her sense of there's always more to do, there's always another day of explaining. Mm -hmm. But it's what we have to do for our future of our kids. It's, it's having hope. If I didn't have hope, 
I couldn't do my job or I couldn't sit here today and talk to you. So no matter what goes on in the world and society, I have to maintain that hope for future generations. So hope keeps you moving forward. It does. And my interaction with the students and the youth is helpful in that. It gives me, it lifts me up and gives me spirit because I see so many young people in universities and college and other areas that want to do the right thing, want to move forward, and they're just waiting to have that opportunity. We mentioned, we were talking a little bit about one, uh, Canada 150, mm -hmm. and in your book you address uh, the celebrations. I'd like to read what you wrote. Okay. Um, you write, one of the things Canada took away from my people was a right to choose how we dressed, what language we spoke, our appearance, even who our people were. I would never take away the opportunity for our people to choose, and those who choose to celebrate or participate in Canada's 150 must be respected. I will be a part of the 150 because I cannot afford to let this opportunity pass. Why couldn't you let the opportunity pass? So it was an opportunity to tell Canada, our people are angry, and they have a right to that anger, and you have to respect that based on history. But it was also the opportunity to talk about real issues. Okay, so Canada's celebrating 150. Well, yes, that's good. Be proud of your country and what you've accomplished, but never forget the underlying fact that the indigenous people have been here for thousands and thousands of years. And so at every event I attended, I respectfully acknowledge the 150, but I also remind everybody about the indigenous history and the things that were going on, the issues we still face, like missing and murdered women, 60s scoop, residential schools. So all that kind of thing was brought to life when they were celebrating the 150. Was your decision to celebrate or to be a part of Canada 150 uh, supported by your community? I believe so. I, I talked about it beforehand and I, and I explained to them, you know, through uh, media, Facebook, Twitter, what you, what you have. And I said, I can't let this go without being a part of this because the world needs to understand and they cannot forget while I celebrate that we have so much work to do. And did you sense any change in Canadians' understanding of reconciliation post Canada 150? That's a very good question. I have, I have sensed, I've seen growth. But, you know, the relationship that started between Canadians and Indigenous people, no matter what happens in the elected system that goes on, that's going to continue because that door has been opened and the people are talking. You know, institutions, schools, people like us are talking about what it means to get to reconciliation. That'll stay open. But the, issue, the other side of that is the legislative impact on the Indigenous people has to be changed and amended. So that that's another tier of it. So while one will go on, I guess a lot really depends on what approach the government is going to take in the future with regards to legislation and impacts of Indigenous people. What would you like to see changed? Well, one of the greatest things that caused some, well, I shouldn't say great, but one of the most important things that caused so much trouble for my people, all people, was the fact that Canada put rules and regulations to guide their people and their belief systems and where they're at in the world, right? So, so say Canada's here, say Indigenous people are here on a, on a circle of life. Well, my beliefs and systems are so much different than your beliefs over here that, that the rules you make here cannot be made to be applicable on us or they cause us so much pain and hurt as what we saw. If you did the same thing, say, say take Canada today and let's move around that circle of life and you make decisions 50 years now or 100 years now and say these are the rules of today and you put them on Canada, no way they could function. They'd be going through the same atrocities, the same processes that happened to my people. So the, the problem is that rules and regulations were not made specific to us. They're made specific to Canadian society. And so the impact is far divergent on what it does. I'd like to ask you to read something from your book if you could, um, and it's the uh, poem, I Am Sorry. Ah. Would you do us that honor? Uh, yeah, I'll read a little bit of it. Okay, just uh, a little bit of it. Yeah, right. and I, I must say though that this is about, um, not about blame, mm -hmm. this is about understanding and knowledge, okay. I am sorry, dollars and programs you offer as retribution for heinous crimes committed inside an institution. Pacify my people or ease your conscience Yet we both know it is all pretense. Say you're sorry for what my people went through. Say you're here to help. I'll pretend to believe you. So what is your offer to make everything right? How many dollars will it take to ease your conscience tonight? 
So give me your money, and the good deeds can commence. Money born in blood, and earned through the brutalization of innocence. Yet know that if I but had the strength, I would spit upon your money. I would turn back, I would turn my back on pretend words that mean nothing to you and less to me. There's what, obviously more of that. But. What inspired this poem? I believe it was inspired when many, many years before the announcement and the apology by, by the pr Prime Minister of the day, there was talk about it. There was talk about the Prime Minister's going to apologize. And it took a long time. But when I heard that, I wrote this poem because I knew that it had to come from a place of understanding, a place of respect. And I didn't think at the time that, the po that an apology was going to be meaningful because I don't think that was going on in society. So I wrote this poem just to give people an understanding of where, where we were at the time and where so they could come and see it and stand in our shoes for a little while. And you've mentioned that it's not to blame, it's for understanding. Yeah, understanding. Well, why is that important to distinguish? Well, because blame is pretty well a, a, a useless tool. I mean, if you have understanding, you can make something of it, you can move forward. But with blame, there's just anger and guilt. So with um, understanding, there's a chance for a lot more. Um, what's your vision of reconciliation going forward for the Mississaugas of the new credit First Nation? Um, see, that's where people misunderstand. Reconciliation in this country is not simply about the indigenous people and Canada. Yes, there are a lot of things we've got to reconcile. And yes, my book talks ab about that a lot. But reconciliation in Canada affects every person who feels marginalized, discriminated against. So it's not just about the indigenous relationship. It's about all of the relationships Certainly there are a lot of things that we have to overcome because of the treatment of the indigenous people and how history progressed. And that's important, but we cannot lose sight of all those others in the country who feel the same way we feel. And so while we're making this movement, let's not marginalize and push aside their needs and their issues. That would be a great way to separate that and cause more diversity, right? And I'd prefer unity. So as long as we remember them in our conversations and our movements, it's important. There's an election coming up in uh, June for the province. Um, what commitments do you hope to see from each of the parties? Well, we have had some success, and, and I won't go into detail because it hasn't been announced and, and things in regards to education, different areas. But I'm hopeful that the understanding for the new government or the old government, whatever it is, will be to continue on a path that recognizes the indigenous people, that allows indigenous people have a stronger say in what's going on in the world around. See, we still say these are our lands. You know, you're welcome here. You're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. Right? No, I'm not. <laughs> I don't want to. I want to stay. So it's always Canada's good to home. Yes. Right. Yes. And so we got to figure out how we're going to do that. And as a family. Yeah. As a yeah. As a relationship. Mm -hmm. And and I'm hopeful that we can do that and move forward. Certainly, there are things that that go on where you, where you have a sense of oh, just, is there still hope? How do we move forward in this climate? Mm -hmm. You know, those things have to go on. But as I said, I have to maintain some sense of hope or I couldn't do what I do. Um, increasingly, you see uh, at city halls like raising the flags of the indigenous communities who occupy the land first, or you hear land acknowledgements at the beginning of events. Um, how are impactful are actions like that? I, I suppose um, to start with, they're impactful because they raise awareness. Um, but in time, if they become just words that are mumbled because it's a process, then they become less impactful, right? So there's, they should only be seen as a way to make movement. They should only be seen as opening a window, if you will, or opening a door of discussion so we can go further than that because that in of itself is just a starting point. Well, you end your book with the words, um, if you do not have a vision, you will never be more than you are. What do those words mean to you? See, when we have discussions about where we're going, it's so easy to get trapped into thinking about the day-to-day -day lives. What does this mean to my paycheck? What does this mean to my family? What does this mean to my car? All those things that we consider every day about gas and living. But that doesn't always make for good decisions because we have lost so many people to residential school, schools, the 60 scoops, 
to legislation that determines who is and is not a member of our people. And I want them to have the opportunity to come home if they want to. And if we think of every day just what that means day to day to day on our impacts, well, how are we going to do that? So we need to think of a future. Who are we, who are we, and who do we want to be? And if you have a vision, you can grow and become more. You don't have to just think about what this means on the ground. You can think about, well, in five years from now, in 10 years from now, you can think more of a... How you can mature, how you can develop. Yeah, yeah. what you can do as a people instead mm -hmm. of what can I do as a person. Individual. Yes. And I think that Canada and the world need to do the same thing. Chief Stacy, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you. And I'm glad that you um, got over the embarrassment of writing poetry because you are <laughs> you do have a talent. Can, can I make one comment? Oh, of course before? you can. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the the shooting that occurred. Colton Bushi. Colton Bushi and the ruling. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's tough to continue finding hope when you see things, and granted from a distance because we are not there. When you see things that appear to be not appropriate. We see things that appear to be not in keeping with justice, right? And one thing we have to remember is if we want reconciliation, there has to be justice. And there has to be justice for all people, poor, rich, black, white, red, yellow. We all have to feel that we're equal in a system of justice. And, that, and maybe that's a problem. It's do a you, system. Do you think that the ruling has... Um uh, maybe it's a roadblock towards reconciliation? Uh, absolutely it is. Um, rightly or wrongly, people's perspectives are changed because of that decision. I've had a, a family, a woman, tell me that she was crying after the verdict. And her kids asked, why? And she said, because we're not safe. And so people don't think of that, but that's the reaction that certain people in our society have when things like this happen. So it's absolutely important that we remember that justice is not about a process and a system. Justice is about right and wrong. And I hope we can find that. Chief Stacy, thank you so much. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.